I am thrilled and super excited uh, to be your moderator here today for just today's talk. Today's talk is about a very interesting man, uh, a man whom maybe many of you may, many of you don't know about, Usman Semben, the father of African cinema. So, Semben spent about fifty plus years of his life using his pen and his camera to tell African story. Today, here we have Samba. Professor uh, Gajigo and Jason to help us learn more about Semben, what, what he was about, and most importantly, one of the things that you guys are doing right now mm -hmm. with Semben across Africa, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. So, Professor, if I may say, Mbada. Mbada, the silly. Yeah, that's all the polar that I know. So. Sorry, we're not saying bad things, we're just speaking in Fulani. <laughs> <laughs> so, Jason, I heard that you speak also some Wolof. Nangade. Uh, Nangade. <laughs> 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 That's awesome. Mm -hmm. So I'm super yeah. excited. We have some really great conversations, and we will leave uh, 15 or 10 minutes at the end for some Q&A. Uh, but Professor, before we can dive into Semben and his work, mm -hmm. I want you to take a minute or two, maybe a few minutes, mm -hmm. to learn a bit more about you. What was it like growing up in Senegal, your childhood? Mm -hmm. right? Tell us where you came from. Okay, thank you, Usman, and thank you all for being here. Of course, my name is Samba Gajigo. Like Usman, uh, I came from Senegal. Uh, I grew up in a small village called Kidira, right at the border between Mali and Senegal. Now, uh, this was uh, before independence in 1960, so I grew up in the late 50s. At that time, really, our village was completely cut off from the rest of the world. And uh, I grew up fishing, hunting, and farming. It might sound very, very romantic, and it was at the time, because it was a free childhood. So we really farmed what we ate, and we ate only what we, what we farmed. So I grew up in that environment, roaming around and really and, uh, listening to stories from our elders. That is pretty amazing. Mm -hmm. So w what kind of activities did you do growing up uh, in Kedira? Well, after all day of farming, of fishing, uh, we had a very practical form of education. It was not education derived from books. It was education derived from examples. If you are male, you go with your father to the field. If you are female, you go with your mother. So we were divided, we learned by experience, by, as I said, going into the fields, going fishing and going farming, and listening mostly is the most important, because it was at the time when really there was no newspapers, there was no television. I saw my first uh, movie when I was 12, and I saw my first radio broadcast literally when I was 10. So the only stories really I heard were stories told by my grandmother and the stories told by elders in the village. So those stories shaped my perception of myself, shaped my perception of the outside world, and also shaped my relationship with that world. So I could say I was very happy no credit card. It was <laughs> it was a great <laughs> childhood. <laughs> That's awesome. Yeah. So uh, tell us a bit about the stories that your grandma uh, told yeah, you about. Yeah, as I said, we did not really learn from books because if you look at many parts of the African continent, there were oral cultures until the advent of Islam and the colonization. There was no writing. So everything was transmitted orally. So how do you accumulate knowledge knowing that there is no technology to archive knowledge? It was by transmission from word of mouth. Those stories to teach you, for instance, about honesty. They would tell you a story about honesty yeah. to scare you to death. <laughs> they would tell you about horror stories, about um, lions, about elephants, and so on and so forth. And those stories, without you really thinking about it, they are really shaping your worldview. Like uh, an American kid before being put to bed and learning about Winnie the Pooh. 
<laughs> that's how you have your world shaped. So those are the stories that really shaped my life. That is pretty incredible. Mm -hmm. So eventually you left that place, right? How, how did you leave and how? Uh, I left my village at age 12. That was really the cutting of the umbilical cord, so to speak, metaphorically speaking. Because in my old area, about 400 miles away, there was no high school. So I was uh, 12. There was a national exam organized, like it's still organized in Senegal and many African countries. And they select what I would call a happy few to take them to high school. So there were two of us who were 12. I still remember that was also my first time to board a train at night to go on a 14 hour ride hmm. at 12. And it was not just a geographical displacement, it was psychological, it is emotional. Because I was leaving my region where we spoke Fulani, and I was going to another region called the Saint Louis, where they spoke Wolof. And Saint Louis was really the first city that was created by the French, who first colonized Algeria, and from Algeria went down south. For Senegal was the first really in sub-Saharan Africa to be colonized. So I went from a rural village where the world stopped at the border of the village, and then I went 400 miles to another area whose language I did not even speak. So it was thrilling when I boarded the plane. I was scared to death when I landed in that platform. I looked around, nothing was familiar. So that's when I went to Sandwich at age 12. Wow, that is pretty incredible. So here you are, 12 years old, in a new city, mm -hmm. away from home. And to this, I mean, I always imagine like the big city, like San Luis back then. Mm -hmm. What was it like to be a 12 years old, far away from home, totally disconnected from your family and to this new world? Yeah, you know, when they announced the result of the exam, of course, I was very, very happy. I mean, who is, a, who is not the bush boy who would dream of going into the city? But then very, very quickly, the thrill was followed, as I told you, with, I was really scared. First, it was cold, because Saint Louis is in the north. Second, I had never seen so many cars in my life. So it was in a village, everybody knows everybody. I remember going playing. When it is mealtime, nobody's going to look for you, because they know if you are not in this house, you are in the other house. So there was a, a tight communal link among us. And now I'm going to a city where you have detribalization. I mean, the tribes are not there. The connections are not there. And it was my introduction to an individualistic culture. Because the city was already an open door to the Western world. And I had to learn everything from scratch. Of course, I did not have the safety of my grandmother being next to me. So you grow up really fast. At age 12, we learn a sense of responsibility and taking care of yourself. Wow. So you didn't speak Wolof then when you arrived in St. Louis. So you get to, you know, you had to adjust speaking mm -hmm. Wolof to a different culture mm -hmm. and then going to school in, in, in St. Louis. Can you tell us a little bit what was high school like? Oh, yeah, it was studying. I still remember getting there. It was a school where I would say it's for elite who were selected from all the regions. So we all find ourselves there with, of course, um, big heads thinking we are the best and the brightest in the world. <laughs> this image still sticks in my mind, walking into my first French classroom and seeing that it was a French woman who was going to be my teacher. Until age 12, I had never shared four words with a white person. That was my first time. And second, I had a French teacher who was from Marseille. I don't know if you ever heard of someone from Marseille speak. Instead of saying du pain, bread, du pain. So it was compl I was completely lost. And then we were forced to read the French classics. Instead of learning about ourselves, not only do you have to master the French language, you have to read Moliere, Balzac, and so on and so forth. So without realizing it, we're being really brainwashed. And at age 14 or 16, if you woke me up in the middle of the night, I could recite Les Miserables. 
<laughs> chapters of the Mizra, paragraphs of the Mizra, or the Pergory or whatever. And if you ask me, Samba, what are you? And very seriously, I will tell you, I am French. Because the textbooks we read drilled in our head that the only culture worth talking about is the French culture. The only literature worth talking about is French literature because they consider of literature that which that is only written, meaning oral literature was not considered as being literature. So at age 16, I was completely gone, not only geographically from my village, but I was culturally, and I, I like to use an image saying at age 16, and I learned that word when I came to the United States, an Oreo cookie meaning to be black in the outside and white in the inside, culturally. That's basically what I had become at age 16. Complete stranger from my village and a complete stranger into that new culture, neither one nor the other and both at the same time. So that's how my situation was at age 16. Wow, so you went to some really deep assimilation to the French culture. So then what happened? It was, I don't know if you have ever experienced this, having an, one single encounter one day that completely changed your life. Well, for me, it happened through a book. Someone gave me a first novel written by a Senegalese. The title is Les Bouts de Bois de Dieu, in French, of course, because the work was written in French. But there was a subtitle that says Banti Mam Yalla. Banti Mam Yalla is in Wolof, which is a national language of Senegal. That was the first shock to see a language of Senegal or a book written by a Senegalese with a subtitle in an African language. That was one. Second, all the fr in all the French textbooks we read, if Africa was at all mentioned, Africans were not shown in their humanity. Africa was at the periphery of the world. And the white colonizer was the eternal winner, and the black folks were losers. And that novel really was a recreation of a, an event that happened in West Africa in 1947, when the first time after the war, of course, there was some political awakening, and the trade unions were starting really to gain consciousness of their rights. So the novel portrays the first union strike between Senegal and Mali. And guess what? One of the characters' name was Samba, like me. That was the first time. And the second, these black workers not only organized themselves, resisted against the white colonizers, but they won. This was the first time I see a black person winning anything, or even being at the center of a narrative. For me, it's, excuse me using this word, I mean, all of a sudden, 16 year old, aspiring to be French, and I completely lose my political virginity, if I can use that word. And I realize that literature is not innocent, that literature is political. And I discovered that Yes, you can be a black person. You are not better than anybody, but nobody is better than you are. And all of a sudden, you discover your humanity and it gives you a certain agency. And that happened, that mental fracture happened to me at age 16, and it happened with a book. And that book actually was written by Semben, to whom I devoted the rest of my scholarship. Wow, that's pretty amazing. <coughs> I highly recommend the book, uh, Le Buddha Bordeja by Usman Samban. Definitely, if you haven't read it yet, uh, do so. Yeah. So, Professor, then what happened? What happened after you discovered Samban? So, uh, you're here now in the US. So. Yes. Well, well <laughs> I was aspiring, in my generation, born in the mid 50s, of course, would go to the university. All the dream was to have an MBA. I did not even know what it was. But everybody was going to the US to do MBA. I wanted to do MBA too. <laughs> but then, since as I told you, that bit of wood had planted already a seed in my mind. But ironically, I go through the university in Senegal, you could not find that book anywhere. It was not in the curriculum. 
The same way, I think, if you were in, from Ghana or you are from Nigeria, you are more likely to read about Shakespeare than to read about Wole Soinka or read any other African writer. But I arrived in the, at the University of Illinois. I go to the library, and then what do I discover? They had all books written by Sembel. They had all films made by Sembel, which you could not find in any African library. So he is 26 year old, coming to the United States. I hardly spoke any, any English. I wanted to be an MBA, MBA, and I discovered these things. All of a sudden, another change. No more MBA, I'm going to do African studies. Are you crazy? You are going to the United States? Instead of looking for money, you are looking for African studies? I said, yes. So I did African studies. I did my PhD in African studies, and then devoted all the rest of my career doing research on, on Sambay. It's pretty cool. So many, many years later, mm -hmm. you made a movie about Sambay. Oh, you both made a movie about Sambay. Mm -hmm. So uh, Jason, can you tell us what is this movie about, Sambay? Uh, well, when we started making the movie, we decided right away it was going to be a story about storytelling, um, about the power of storytelling, and about how, um, you know, a question, who gets to tell the stories that define us? And Sam Ben is a really remarkable figure because um, he decided that he was going to restore African stories. His, his own biography is an incredible story, which mm -hmm. Samba knows mm -hmm. much about. Yes. Um, why did I decide to do Sam Ben? In a nutshell, I'll call him, I call Sam Ben an ordinary man who did extraordinary things. And there were so many connections. Like Sam Ben, I mean, like me, Sam Ben came from a small village. I came from a family of wood carvers. Samben was the son of a fisherman. But I think the similarities stopped there because at age 13, he beat his school teacher who was French and he was expelled from school. So a third grade dropout became a mason. He started going into construction work. Then during World War II, like many Africans, he was forcibly enrolled into the French colonial infantry unit to go fight for the liberation of France. After the war, he finds himself in Marseille as a dock worker. I don't know if you have ever seen a dock worker, like when the ship arrived, at the time they did not have all these containers. So it was human being lifting these 200 pound bags and putting them in trucks. So Semben did that. And in 1951, while doing that, he broke his backbone. Well, while he was at the hospital, during six months, he started reading. He discovered literature. And all of a sudden, like a eureka moment, my God, I read all these books. I read uh, Richard Wright, who talked about Americans. Nobody is talking about the African working class. Nobody is talking about the African farmers. Nobody is talking about the African women. Well, I am going to teach myself how to write in order to be the voice of the voiceless. And he made it happen. It is pretty incredible. Uh, can you tell us a little bit, you know, more like what he's, he, he was about, you know, and mm. if there was like, one or three things you wanted us to know about Samban, what those would be? Well, he's a unique filmmaker, I think. For someone who has grown up, of course, in the United States, you, there is a new movie that comes out. Let's take, for instance, Black Panthers. The next day, you have articles in the New York Times. The first thing they are talking about is the success at the box office, meaning money, how profitable is the film. Well, Samban made films not for entertainment, yes, entertainment, of course, but he conceived of them as a replacement for the African traditional storytellers who have been wiped up out by the colonial adventure. So his films, and this is a direct quote, is a, an evening school to educate to the African masses. I think to give you an idea, an outlook of Semben and how it's different from your average filmmaker, be it African, in Indian, or Nigerian. He had a big poster at his study at home with a poster of Lenin 
the father of the Soviet Revolution, and there was a caption. An artist should make money in order to live and work, but never live and work in order to make money. It's fascinating. At a time when money is driving the world, you have this individual saying, I'm going to use my work, my written work, to fight for African political and cultural liberation. For me, at least, I think that is what is unique about Sembe. Yeah, the quote that opens our film is, uh, if Africa loses its stories, Africa will disappear. And so he spent 50 years trying to restore or reclaim these stories for Africa. Wow, that's pretty cool. And he taught himself how to make movies. I mean, there was no infrastructure when he arrived back in Senegal from Marseille. There was no trained crew. There was no funding. Uh, he had to figure everything out from scratch, basically. A lot of times there's not electricity. And, uh, and he had to invent the African cinematic form because no one was using movies to tell African stories. So he did that all himself. After teaching himself how to write and writing three successful novels, he was something of a celeb celebrity in France before he left. That's so right. Yeah. The dock worker who wrote novels, and then he took that fame and left it behind and moved back to Senegal and found a camera and started shooting. Yeah. Actually, that is, a, I think, a, something to elaborate in that. Yes, as Jason said, of course, between 1956 and 1960, he had written three novels. And all the novels were really to participate in the liberation of Africa. Then he arrives in Senegal in 1960. He discovered, oh my God, I wrote these books in French. And 82% of the Senegalese do not read in French. So therefore, it's really talking to a wall. Well, that's when, as Jason said, well, I'm going to try to find another medium which is going to reconcile me with African people. How can I talk to the Senegalese farmer? How can I talk to the Senegalese fisherman? Well, I think the best way to do it is to use the technology of filmmaking. So that's when, again, as Jason said, he decided he was, I think, 40 <laughs> <laughs> to sail to the Soviet Union and to teach himself how to make films just so that he can reconnect with the African people. That is impressive. Mm. So some men as a writer transform as a filmmaker. Mm -hmm. So how hard was it for him back then to make his first movie in Senegal? Well, I think Jason has started touching on that. He arrives in Senegal. Nobody had made a film before. And, and it's illegal. Yeah, it is actually illegal because the French and the British had very early on understood the subversive nature of filmmaking. That really the camera was a weapon. They all, the same way they had realized that the pen was a weapon. So for instance, here in the history of African-American slavery, I mean, they were prohibited even from reading or writing because the barrel of the pen was like the barrel of the gun, basically. So the French legislation issued a decree no African is allowed to pick up a camera from 1945 to 1960 to portray its own people. So it was prohibited. So it was criminalized. So Semben came back, no money. He had an old 16 millimeter camera which he was given. Nobody, since nobody had made money in Senegal, of course there was no film industry, no distribution channels, no actors. What did Semben do? He's an old camera. He went in the street. His friends became his actors. Family members became his crew. And he literally, with single-handedly, with his bare hands, he invented African cinema in 1963. Everybody who makes a film today in Africa has followed in the footsteps of Semben. So, uh, if we look at his work between 1963 to 2004, mm -hmm. He made about nine feature films. Uh, can you tell us a little bit more about those films, the teams, and what issues Semben was dealing with? Yeah, I'll let, well, I define this, and that maybe let's Jason elaborate on that. I mean, yes, you're right. He, his filmography was stunning within the context of Africa. I know in the United States there are people who make a film every other year, and it's very heroic. On a continent when there is no industry, there is no funding, there is no state support to make even one feature film. Samben made nine, and a handful of short films. 
And of course, I cannot, it would take a, a semester seminar to get into all those works. But I think that he dealt with all issues Africa is facing. But I think there are two, three themes that could help structure the diversity of those themes he dealt with. First, it is African independence. Because starting the 19th century, 1885, the continent was divided among Western powers, what they called the sharing of the African cake in Berlin. So uh, England, France, Portugal shared the continent. For Semben, the first thing was to fight for political independence, like our political leaders did, like Nkrumah in Ghana, for instance. So he wanted to do in literature and the film what those people were doing. So political independence is the first thing. But Semben was also one of those artists who was convinced that the only possible survival for the continent, at least after independence, was justice within each of the states. Liberation of women, liberation of the marginalized, the sharing of justice and so on. So that is the second. So you have the first which is independent, the second which is justice. Actually he calls it socialism because he's convinced that capitalism will never liberate Africa but that it is social. And the third element which actually he inherited from luminaries like Du Bois, Krumin, Kruma, and so on and so forth, was the reunification of a continent that was cut into pieces by the colonial divide. So three themes, independence, justice, and pan-Africanism. Those are the three major themes. Whatever film you take, I think those are the current that are running. I don't know if you could address any of the individual films. Abuse of power, I mean, he was very, uh, a lot of his films deal with corruption, and, uh, and so a lot of them were banned because they offended the leadership. Um, yeah, I think that's, that, that covers it well. He also wanted to restore um, or update oral history and turn it into a new modern medium. So his films were really inventive um, formally and, and technically, too. Yeah, and he's the first one. I mean, he made his first three films, I think, in, uh, in French. But then, Revolution in 1968, he started making films in African languages. Mm -hmm. He's the first ever to make a film in Wolof. And now, you go to Ghana, you go to Nigeria, you go to Burkina Faso, 90% of the people are making their films into African languages. So which really helps to reconnect the African artist with uh, the African public. And that is also something that was initiated by, by Sambe. Hmm. So, so uh, if I listen also with your project Sambe across Africa, you went to a great length to get that work known into the world. Uh, what is this project about? Can you tell us about Sambe across Africa? What is it about? Yeah, we talked about Semben having made nine films. It was very, very heroic. But the sad reality, and this is not only Semben, the sad reality is that it's easier to find a novel written by an African or a film made by an African. It's easier to see it in Seattle, Washington, in London, in Paris, or in Toronto than to see it in Africa itself. So our stories were taken away from us before independence. We reappropriate those stories. Guess what? They are here sleeping in the, li in the Western libraries. You, you could spend six, you know this, you are Senegalese like me, you could spend six months in Dakar without seeing one single Senegalese film. So that's why Jason and I decided, well, how can we be innovative? Of course, we are always broke. We don't have money to do it. <laughs> we volunteered for 10 years to do this kind of work. Jason and I decided, OK, let's find a way or a program or a project which would allow us, uh, at least symbolically to start with, mm -hmm. to give back those stories to Africans. So we labeled it Semben Across Africa. We studied it in 2017, on the 10th anniversary of Semben's passing. We took our documentary, got some funding from the Faud Foundation, we flew back to Senegal, and we gave micro-grants to different localities. Actually, not only Senegal, we gave money to 38 African countries, and we sent free copies of our films, and in 72 hours, one weekend, 
38 African countries were able to see Samben's film. So that's what we call, of course, Samben across Africa. But as Samben, as uh, Jason can elaborate, for us, Samben is only a stepping stone to do more, not only to show our documentary, but to show Samben's films, but also to show all the African, African films. Yeah, the project was a symbolic one. We, we um, basically reached out to our contacts and um, across the continent and said, would you like to show the film in any way you would like to? Most of the cultural programming here and in, in um, developing countries is top-down programming, where an NGO will decide what to show or what to share, how to show it, and they'll spend substantial money to do that. This was the opposite. We just gave um, funds and the resources to communities, to educators, you know, um, there was cafes in Johannesburg and, and um, elementary schools in Cameroon, um, a military camp, um, churches, um, a book club in rural Rwanda. Mm -hmm. Whoever thought that these stories could be useful to their community and was motivated to share these stories, we gave them the, the films, including some of Sam Ben's films. Mm -hmm money they would need sometimes for a generator. Um, some of the screenings were during the winter, mm -hmm. so they would need blankets and, and fireplaces, um, some for marketing. Um, so they would figure out how to do it, and they did it. And over the f uh, three years we've done it, I think there's been 400 uh, public screenings. We've done broadcast um, of the films across the continent, free streams of the films across the continent. Um, and the response has been incredible. People are hungry for these stories, and you know, and so we feel like there's a there's a way to do this in a bigger, bolder way. Yeah, but that's 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 really awesome. Mm -hmm. So uh, looking at the four billion people uh, in this world, I mean, the seven point seven billion, four billion of them are considered to be voiceless. How do you see this project help close that gap and address this issue, mm -hmm. like Samman's work, bringing voice back to those voiceless? Yeah, as a, I mean, say, again, say Jason has started talking about that. I mean, at, what we did was only symbolic because we did not have all the resources. All we had was really our vision and concerned citizens out there of the world out there who gave us the money. So our vision is really to create, to have the resources to be able on a daily basis to make those stories available to the African people. So, uh, and we are open to any kind of partnership, to any kind of support, because those stories, yes, they are Senegalese stories, yes, they are African stories, but freedom is not an African story. It is a universal story. Liberation of the oppressed is not Senegalese. I mean, it's universal. So I think our vision is one day to reach a level where those stories can cross borders create a synergy and create a dialogue among cultures. I mean, we, we live in a media monoculture, and you know, when you go back to Kadira, you see that there's not people telling stories around the fire anymore. Mm -hmm. There's people watching Western TV and Brazilian telenovelas, and, mm -hmm. um, and that's a loss for everybody. It's a loss that these stories don't exist, that Semben stories are not accessible in Africa and elsewhere, that I'm not able to see them oftentimes because I'm enriched and deepened by these stories. So the question is, is how can we leverage new technologies to um, create more diversity in our global media environment? And uh, Semben is a great example of someone who uh, did it by any means necessary. I mean, it was really hard to do what he did. And working with 16 and 35 millimeter film in Africa is a, like Samba said, a heroic endeavor. But today it's not that difficult to do. I mean, anyone with a cell phone that has a camera can make a movie and upload it to YouTube. So there's a way in which um, we can use new technologies to share stories that come from the grassroots, that come from um, indigenous communities. and uh, but it's scattershot at this point. So the question becomes, how do you organize all that energy in such a way that people have access on a continuous basis? People can use these stories to knit together communities that have been split apart by um, globalism. And you know, this, these are the questions that, that this project 
got us thinking about. Yeah, no, it's, it's, it's very fascinating. The first time I heard about this project, I was on a transatlantic flight going <laughs> back home uh, to see my mom, and I sat next to Samba, and he shared with me the work he was doing, and I saw the potential impact around it. Uh, it sounds like you do have some challenges in scaling up this project, and what I'm hearing is this is an area that technology could help, right? Could you tell us more about your challenges and maybe what is needed to scale up this initiative? Well, I mean, Samba's right. This is a kitchen table project. Samba works at his kitchen table in, in um, South Hadley, Massachusetts. I work at my kitchen table in Santa Fe, New Mexico. And um, we've been able to do this. And, and the thing that energizes us is the response from the communities to the opportunity to share these stories with their communities. And, um, and so the question becomes, how can it become something that, that's sustainable? And how can we reach more people? And we reached a lot of people with a little bit of money. Um, can we find ways to make these stories available on a continuous basis? Can there be a library of stories that's available? Can we um, create events that are larger in scale that can reach more people? Um, and the questions on how to do that involve um, just the, the basic te technological questions. How do we store this material? How do we, how do we share it? How do we protect it from, how do we protect the copyright of this material? Marketing questions, how do we reach all of these audience? And of course, resource questions, how do we fund it so it's, it's mm -hmm. continuous? Yeah, that's pretty awesome. Mm -hmm. So I've been going at it for a while. I think this is a great stopping point now that we segue into the technology part and the problem. So I'm going to open it up for some Q&A, some questions for our audience. So thank you, first of all. Um, <clears throat> going back to when you were talking about the uh, community feel growing up and how that's different from like the very individual way that we live today, is there, in your opinion, a way to recapture some of this, given the way we live and that it's not really going to stop? I feel myself wanting some of that, but I just don't know what we can do. Uh, that's a very interesting question. And uh, Samben and I travel the world. We get that question all the time. How do we recreate this kind of idyllic past? Well, Samben's answer and my own answer is that a river never flows back to its source. I think we cannot, we should not. It's, even, it's not even desirable that we reinvent the African past. But how can we take what is valuable in that past, combine it with something new and create a new Africa, which would be a synthesis, a symbiosis of the, our, di our dialogue with the rest of, of the world. There is no way you can go back to my village, recreate my village, and recreate the circumstances under which I grew up. But there are certain values, I think, that could taint that could determine our modernity, family, collective interest, for instance, communality, reappropriating our stories. I'm not thinking we can bring back the griots who have died about 100 years, but how can we use the camera and the pen to unearth those stories and to make them count? Not exoticism, just something at the margin, but how can those values can help Africans confront the modern world. Just one example, in terms of languages, you go to Nigeria, you go to Liberia, you go to Ghana today, people speak their national languages, but only Western languages are official languages. Language of education, language of trade, language of diplomacy, meaning then the majority of the languages are minority languages when it comes to giving agency to people. If you want to succeed today in Africa, you have to know English, you have to know French, you have to. How can we change that situation, use our own languages to create our own modernity? It is do doable, it's a matter of political will. Right. Samben did show it by making films in Wolof, right? Uh, Ayukwe Arma has done it by writing a beautiful novel, The Beautiful Ones Are Not Yet Born. 
how can you in Kenya, Ngugi Wachongo, who teaches here at Owan, started writing books in Kikuyu? Bubakar Buri's job is writing books in Wolof. So those are things I think we can take from the past, revalorize them, and use them for our survival, not only survival for us to thrive in that modern world, but Africa of the past is not going to come back because the world does not flow back to its source. Yeah, I think it's important to recognize that we've been programmed to be individualistic um, and separate ourselves from our community. I mean, that's one thing that um, Western media does to us. I mean, every time we watch a movie, uh, there's a superhero who's saving the world <laughs> on our behalf. And no superhero has ever saved the world. It's always been collective action that's, that's made positive change in the world. There's no Hollywood films about celebrating collective action. I mean, very few. And so we are, we're, we're taught that we're, we're at our best when we're on our own. And it's, you know, Sam Ben's films always celebrated the collective and celebrated the community. People did things together when, when change was made. And I, I don't think that's atypical. I think a lot of films outside of um, the commodity culture are made and stories are told that celebrate us working together. And so I think it's important to recognize how our brains have programmed us to, to behave the way that we behave. Mm -hmm. Does that address the question? Yeah, thank you. Mm -hmm. I mean, my, my uh, father's from Jamaica, so I, I hear stories of how he grew up, which are similar, you know, in a village, very tight-knit. Um, I don't have kids yet, but you know I hope to. Mm -hmm. So it's a big question for me. You know, how can I take, like you're saying, the essence, and at least mold that into you know the reality that I that I'm a part of today? So, you know, mm -hmm. the the Google mission is inspiring to me. Mm -hmm. You know, the idea that we make information available and accessible. I think Sam Ben would have approved of that mission. Uh, you know, the idea was. There are st stories that are lost and, and, and buried, and they need to be unearthed and shared if we are going to uh, connect with each other and make real progress. So, so you mentioned uh, some Benes movies were about uh, independence, social justice, uh, <clears throat> Pan-Africanism. And I think those same themes uh, still exist today, um, just in different forms. My question is, um, what are your thoughts around uh, making like movies or theater a tool for socioeconomic transformation um, back in Africa. So that's my first question. And my second question is just, I love the work you guys are doing. Um, it's really inspirational. And sincerely, I grew up in Ghana, and mm -hmm. this is the first time here at Sambeni. So it just shows the huge gap um, we have when it comes to information and how much we know about our own people. But my, qu my second question is, how do we raise the next generation of Sambenis? Like, uh, Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> <So>. <laughs> yes, that's a billion dollar question. Yes, I think you, the themes that Sam Ben dealt with in his work are still, are, are still with us, really. Because I think Sam Ben was a, a visionary. He saw the future. I mean, his future is our present. And I think all the problems he had seen were still living. The problem of the reunification of the continent. Most African countries gained independence in 1960. What is called the Organization of African Unity was created since 1963. We are still talking about uniting the continent. And when you look at Samben's films, also mostly um, the same films that were set in Senegal, they are all depicting a local black bourgeoisie which has hijacked our national independence. So, issue of social justice is still there. Independence. One example, still the former 14 French colonies in Africa, they're still using a currency that is controlled by France. All our resources are controlled by Europe. So issue of political, economic, and social independence is still current. But Semben was one of these visionaries who really understood that slavery, colonization, and oppression came through stories that were told. That therefore, even if you showered Africa with billion today, as long as there is no cultural freedom, uh -huh. the, uh, freedom to use our languages, 
freedom to you, create our own myths, create our own metaphors, I mean, the continent will always be in the yoke of foreign occupation. So those are the issues that Semben dealt with. Those are the issues my generation is dealing with. That is the issue your generation is still dealing with in, in, in Africa. I mean, we are here in Seattle, Washington. There is a saying in my language. They say, when you see a frog jumping in the hot sun, because there is no peace under the water pot. What are the conditions that need to be created in Africa so we all go back to Africa? And it does not mean to shut ourselves out of the rest of the world, but how, how make it in such a way that Africa is our reference in the world. And I think that the challenge Semben face, the challenge we are facing, the challenge you are facing, now what, are, what Africa are you going to create for your children? I think that's the main question, and it is a collective responsibility. What we are doing, as Jason said, is that the symbolic small way for us to contribute towards that. But we all have that same responsibility, in my view. So, Professor, can you, can you comment a little bit the second part of the uh, question? Mm. How do we raise the next generation of Sambans? How do we bring them? Go ahead, Jason. Uh, well, <laughs> Semben can inspire people to tell their own stories. I think that's the most important part is, you know, Anyone who makes an independent film can talk about how difficult it was, but the degree of difficulty that he faced was extreme. And he still did it because he was motivated to use stories to make a better world. So that's not an African mm -hmm. inspiration. And, and um, the next generation of Sembens can be anywhere. They can be in any, uh, from any inner city, from any um, rural community, anywhere across the world. Um, anyone who feels like this story is not being told who feels empowered to tell that story themselves. And I think the technological opportunities, um, you, know, ra you know, lower the, you know, the barriers to entry to, to such an extent that anyone can do it if they feel motivated. And so what I would hope for this project is that more young people will say, I can do it. And uh, that's, that's one way to raise them is to introduce uh, young filmmakers, young artists, young writers uh, to works that really resonate with them and create some sort of um, alternative to the, the monoculture that, that is swamping a lot of the world right now. Mm -hmm. And I think that you know, the, the tools that are available um, make it so much easier that it's really just a matter of communicating the idea to people. Jason, you said uh, earlier that these stories they really enriched you and like inspired you right and you mentioned also that when you um you visit countries you go back to your home country of senegal they're watching western films mostly um and some of these films or a lot of the films that were even made there might not have been made in a local language well and also that we need to garner support in order to like enrich these programs and spread them are there any things being so this is interesting for me because I'm enriched by being here, right? And largely I'm here thanks to Usman who was able to bring this. So there's like a lot of coincidences that had to happen in order for me to get this enrichment. Are there things being done here to spread Semben's films so that you know people here can be inspired and maybe it can gain momentum? Um, you know, because I feel like there's a lot of hunger at places to like show films like this at local coffee shops and those kind of things. Is there anything like in, in, in around here, not even necessarily Seattle, but yeah. Go ahead. I mean, I think, I think you know, YouTube is, the, is, the, is a great democratizing force in terms of um, global media. I mean, it's, it's providing content on demand for, for people around the world. And, uh, and the question is, is can, can these platforms be used uh, to help strengthen community? and to um, open people's minds and to inspire them and to bring meaning into the world and to encourage you know, critical thinking and creative problem solving. And I think they can. You know, uh, the way that Sam and I talk to each other is greatly enriched by our, you know, our, the depth of understanding we have for Semban's films. We have a language that helps us talk about how to solve problems. And so it's a question of how do we connect um, people to the content that already exists? Is there a way to strengthen those 
to deepen those channels and to, to make them, because a lot of the work is available or could easily be available. Uh, people don't know it yet. And they might not know how to watch it. And they might not uh, watch it within community, which also strengthens your experience. Mm -hmm. So those are questions that I think can be fairly easily addressed you know, through technology even. Yeah, I think the technology is available now. It's how to take that African specific content and to make it available and give it back to, to African. Every year, there are hundreds of films that are being made on the continent. In Senegal, at least each year, there is at least one feature film that is made in Senegal. So I think if outlets like Google or any other uh, support would take that content. I mean, people are spending all their days in Senegal, in my village, for instance, w watching Hindi movies on, on their cell phones. Yeah. What can we do to make sure? Yes, they can keep on watching Hindi movies. It's good, because whatever you get from the other is richening for you. But you have to start with yourself. How can we take African content and make it available to that technology so that Africa can share it, not only among Africans, but also share it with the rest of the world? And I think there is something very symbolic we should not lose. The fact that this guy from Connecticut and me from Senegal were able to walk to have the same vision and to, to, for 10 years through our kitchen table to create this, it means that it is doable when there is a vision, the political will. I think now the technology is here. And, and it's not just Africa. I mean, it's, it's it's everywhere. Th these kinds of projects could happen anywhere once an infrastructure is built, once models are built that could encourage people to connect with media that matters to them. I love that you reflected back mm -hmm. the fact that how I was enriched by this, how you're enriched by it. And it's important to know that, um, that these stories are not one-way streets. They're not, they're not closed loops. They can really, you know, the more that we hear from other cultures and other communities, the more open-minded we become. The more open-minded we become, the more flexible we become in, in problem solving. And obviously, we need a lot of um, critical thinking right now to solve these global problems that are facing us. I think stories are, you know, are not secondary to that. I mean, obviously, they're at the, they're at the forefront. And, and Semben recognized that. I mean, mm -hmm. Semben could have been president of Senegal. He could have been, he was offered a ministry in Senegal, but he decided that the battleground for him was storytelling. It seemed like Semben was uh, self-taught in a lot of ways. Um, and uh, even from the the bits of his films that were in the documentary, it seemed to, he seemed to have a kind of an original um, style, but I, I don't quite know how to describe it, and I haven't seen a lot of his work. Um, could, can you talk a little bit about the characteristics of his visual style or his storytelling technique that, mm -hmm. that are? Yeah, I mean, like many other African filmmakers, Samben get his training abroad in the Soviet Union in uh, 1962. That was, of course, during the Cold War. <laughs> I mean, of course, the Soviet Union also wanted to have its share of the African cake by uh, sponsoring a lot of African filmmakers. So Semben learned how to make films in the Soviet Union, of course, was also influenced by the Soviet realism type of making films. I mean, he is crazy about Lenin. I quoted this poster of Lenin at his door with the, with the caption. But also, Semben lived in France for a long time and has contacted many French filmmakers. And you could also see in his uh, early films, the first three films, a certain touch of Italian neorealist influence. Of course, way capturing not the high culture, but the everyday, the everyday life. But then I think starting in 1968, I think I alluded to that when he started making films in Wolof, he started searching for what he called an authentically African film language. Mm -hmm. Because you have 55 African countries, you have thousands of languages, you have thousands of cultures, how to cross those linguistic and cultural barriers and make a film that could speak to the entire continent. So there is one phrase he used sometimes. He said, well, our languages are so many that an African filmmaker should try to find a way whereby we start hearing with our eyes and seeing through our ears, which means through gesture, through other devices, through shared cultural practices. How can we read a film? 
without mm -hmm. using any, actually his vision was maybe we should return to the silent film and use all the resources that are pertinent to African culture so that a film made in Burkina Faso could be understood in the Sudan, or filmmaker in the Sudan could be understood in South Africa. Yes, and I think the starting point was the African languages, and from 1968 to his death in 2017, all his films are in African languages. Not only Senegalese languages, because his last his film was in Jula, and Jula is a language from Mali, Cote d'Ivoire, and, uh, and, and Senegal. So yes, there was a Western influence of, we all are, I mean, you cannot, be exposed to it without being influenced. And I think it's very salutary to, we take everything we can from anywhere we can get it, but also we have to create our own. And I think that is, Samben, his, his entire life has been searching for that something that will create a dialogue among all Africans. That's what I would call Samben's film language, tactically. It was very economical language too. I mean, he didn't have a lot of resources, so, um, you know, he would shoot fairly simply, especially at the beginning. There's a there is a crane shot in his last film, and mm. that's his crane shot for the, for his entire 40 year career. Mm. And um, he was very interested in um, sound, as Samba said, yeah. and so he thought a lot about how to record sound. Um, so those are some of the influences. I think mm. you know he was he was he evolved and he thought about form and content to how to tell a particular story. Mm. Some of his films were much more colorful um, in terms of palette than others, um, and uh, yeah, he was he was he was very, he had to be very practical in the way he shot. Just one last thing, uh, in case of course there are a lot of interesting questions that have been asked here. What is Samben all about? And I think just one short story in one minute to give you who Samben was and what cinema meant to him. I, he invited me on the set of his last film, which is about female genital mutilation. He was 82 years old. It was in June, 100 degrees in Burkina Faso. We were filming over 11 weeks. One day he collapsed. I went and told him, let's take a break. I take you to a hotel, you rest. And he said, I quote, Samba, I will have enough time to rest after I die we have to make this film. That's how meaningful cinema was to Samben. Mm. I will have enough time, <clears throat> sorry, to rest after I die. Let's make this film. And I think that's what it gives you an idea of what value he gave to cinema. Thank you. Very, very powerful. So <clears throat> as a close out, if you have one or two things you wanted to leave with us today or to share about Samben. Go ahead, yes. Well, yours was very good. Um, <laughs> <laughs> you go, go, go ahead. <laughs> yeah, that's a pretty good closing statement. Um, I would say um, uh, we have the, the, the tools um, and the stories to make real progress in rebuilding community in, um, in creative problem solving. I mean, they exist already. It's just a matter of deploying at this point. Uh, I think Sam Ben's films, they're all getting restored. We, we've helped uh, get them out of the archive and, and um, the Criterion Collection will be releasing all of the films um, coming soon. So they're gonna be available to the world again. And, uh, and, he's, and he's one of you know many filmmakers who have told stories with great commitment, stories that can um, help us understand the world in, the, in a deeper way. And so I hope that we can find ways to connect those stories with the people who can be, uh, find them most meaningful. Mm. That's awesome. And Professor, do you have any final notes for us? Well, I think uh, he has, we have said it all here. I think I'm just very, very happy. I think Sam Benz, wherever he is, if he could see this, our richness in our diversity. That's what Samben's dream was. And I think that the kind of, when I'm doing this kind of work, and I think that the world I want to leave to my children and to my children's children. Um, and I think Samben, despite the limits of his means, the few films he made are going to be, uh, how do you call it, um, eternal, so to speak. Uh, one last thing, those of you who are interested in digging more about Samben, 
some, Jason and I worked for five years. Now all his manuscripts are housed at Indiana University in, in Indiana. And I'm sure if you go here to the University of Washington, there are some bands for him. So we're just, this first opportunity, thanks to Anna and Usman, thank you very much for doing this. It was just to plant a seed. It's our collective responsibility to make sure that the tree grows. Uh, a big thank you to Jason and Professor uh, Gajigo, if I, if I can say again in Wolof. Yes. Jarama. Jamagyama. Jamagyama. Thank you. Even the guy speaks Wolof now. <laughs> <laughs> thank you.